Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, I am excited to be here after a week off. Uh, last week, I held the first ret retreat at our farm, um, Ojo Conejo, and it was a uh, homeopathic intensive for my students. And honestly, it couldn't have went any better. It was amazing. It was, it was, I had a lot of eye opening um, moments in a very good way. And it was really special to uh, connect with everyone in person to see in person sessions. We all um, saw in person sessions together. It was great to hug everyone in person. I know this is like, oh yeah, the um, social distance thing is over, but no, you know, we, we're really in the, we're really in the virtual world right now until Pluto goes into Aquarius. We got some, we got a little time, but not much, but um, <laughs> I think it could be a good thing. It may seem like a, it may seem like a blow up at first, but I think it could be good. But anyway, I know um, that the in-person thing may sound old school, but I really, I really think we need to start bringing back more in-person, connecting, gathering, eating, teaching, learning, healing, farming, everything, just, just add to that list, right? Um, and you know, I've known, I've known this. I'm like, yeah, I really want to work towards the in-person. And you all know, I talk about it, um, here sometime I'll mention how I'm going to an in-person practice and so forth. And I'm moving in that direction, but something clicked this weekend around all of that. Um, literally at the end of the re retreat, every single person, you know what they said? They said, I can't believe how, how much more potent and connected the in-person sessions were. Like hands down, not even, there's no comparison versus virtual. And don't get me wrong, it's amazing to have a virtual option. Um, it's really helpful and people can still get well when seen virtually. I don't want you to get the wrong impression. Um, that's absolutely possible. I wouldn't have a business if it wasn't possible for the past 10 years, right? But something happens in person. There's a there's a palpable difference. And, you know, people open up and you can see their emotions, you can see their mannerisms, you can see their expressions, you can um, sense and talk about feelings more and you can see their personalities really come to life in an entirely new way. And not only is this healing for the patient, but as a practitioner, I personally find that I can often, not always, but but often, and this is a higher, much higher often, uh, pinpoint the remedy so much more effectively and quickly when seeing people in person. And this weekend we saw a lot of cases in person. It was like, just boom, one after another, boom, boom, boom. And I, I, this was a really good example. I need to share this with you all because it was just like, we were all cracking up about this at the retreat, but during the retreat, um, one, uh, woman was in the student clinic and I was taking her case in front of the other students. And she was so prepared. It was on point, right? She was so organized. She was ready for her session. She had her notes out. She'd like been prepping for this. Her list was there, ready to go through, bullet pointed. It was like so on point, so ready to go. And typically, especially virtually, it can take me um, an hour plus for me to pinpoint the patient, the person's remedy. Okay. It could take some time. Um, it's easy to hide behind a screen. It's really easy, but also not just hiding. You just, there's certain aspects of the person you just don't see or feel when you're in person. Well, this woman, I, uh, literally I could, I could observe her, her mannerisms, see her interactions. And I've seen this person virtually for almost a year now. Okay. And of course we've been making progress, but this session literally took the cake. And I think if she listens to this session, she's going to be like, Oh, that's me. Yep. That was it. <laughs> but 
Um, so, so this woman, she was like, she was so ready. She was on point. She was, she was looking at her list. She's sitting in, in her chair, ready to go, ready to share her case with all of us. And she literally says one sentence of, of what's going. I don't even think the notes were involved yet. I think I just said, what do you want to work on today? And she said one thing. And I literally knew her remedy. It was like just by through observation from being here, from witnessing, and then adding that one sentence she shared to, um, it was like, um, it literally, it literally took about 30 seconds to say, oh, like this, <laughs> this is your remedy. This is so your remedy. Now, of course, I was like, you know, I know you took a lot of time putting that list together and these symptoms are important. Of course, a hundred percent share the list with us, keep going. And, and I'm just like looking at the students around the room, like you guys, you know, the remedy, like, you know, it. it's like, you know, <laughs> right. And so now not every in-person session is like this, of course, but this case was, and the patients we saw in the clinic last weekend were a much shorter duration um, and the picture was much clearer because of this in-person exchange that is literally there are just some aspects that are impossible to get to see to obtain through a screen and um i don't see that many in-person clients right now. I just haven't had time to set up my practice with developing the farm and, you know, my students and work and so forth. So, you know, it, it hasn't shifted in that direction yet. Um, but within the next couple of weeks, because of this experience, because people get better quicker in that type of environment. And I'm, I'm questioning right now, if I know that there's a lot of horse shit out there with regard to supplements and this protocol and that and this detox. And we know that we know it's super saturated with complete BS. And this is why people are like, I do that. People get so hardcore about a thing because they just want to feel better. Right. And they do that thing hardcore and maybe they feel a little bit better, but as soon as they don't do that hardcore thing, they feel worse. Um, or they just don't feel better in general. And um, I am really, really questioning at this time, um, is this virtual world, especially around healing, because I know some people go to in-person practitioners and they're like, Heather, they're they're full of it and it didn't help me as seeing them in person in person i know it depends on like the modality and the approach and so forth but maybe i should say from a homeopathic perspective seeing somebody in person um makes a huge difference and i'm really wondering right now if just in general with whatever medicine you are choosing to use and not use and so forth i'm wondering how much the virtual health care um, is actually prolonging somebody's healing, um, is actually contributing to the issue. We know it's contributing to the issue in terms of Wi-Fi, in terms of screen time and so forth, right? Um, but I know you guys all use Ethernet and have Iris on your, your computer anyway, but, but there's something with the personal interaction and connection and witnessing and observing that happens, that can only happen in person. Um, so within the next couple of weeks, this, this whole realization has inspired me to um, at least put this in-person option uh, available for people. And so you can expect my website to shift a bit over the next couple weeks. Um, and this August, I'm gonna be adding in-person sessions uh, and I'm gonna, going to be adding actually functional movement sessions, which if you have an online virtual personal trainer, um, I'm sure it might be benefiting you in some way, but 
it's probably it's not a it's it's not going to get you as far as you can actually get with in person stuff. And I'm not going to get into the functional movement stuff here that much. I mentioned it, and I think I did a podcast episode on this topic, maybe a couple a month or two ago, uh, maybe a little bit longer, but it was relatively recently, sometime this year. And I'm going to dedicate more podcast episodes to this topic to um, to help support and inspire people around moving in a way that's not CrossFit and like balls to the wall. And like, you know, you're basically dead for a week after you do the workout, but, um, functional movement was also a core component, a bonus addition to this past weekend's retreat. And I noticed one, how much that I miss teaching this and, uh, and also how much people need and benefit from it. And so this in-person offering around functional movement will also be up on my site very soon. And I'll share more about this in upcoming weeks as well. Okay, I didn't even mention, today we're gonna to talk about eye health in the podcast. So, I mean, that's probably an important thing to, to share here. I'm gonna talk about eye health and I'm gonna talk about um, macular degeneration. I'm gonna talk a little bit about retinal detachment. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about this topic here um, on the, on the podcast today. And, um, lastly, before I, I go there, I want to mention that, um, after hearing what I just shared in the intro here that you, you might be thinking, okay, well, how can I join a homeopathic retreat? And that one's a little bit specific. You have to be a student of mine to join the, the homeopathic retreat. And I will, I'm going to let everyone know right here, I've actually postponed this year's practitioner training until January, 2024. There was some scheduling conflicts. There were some things that came up. The date needs to be postponed this year to January, 2024. So if you're interested in that, and maybe January works better than September for you, because I was going to launch it this September, 2023, Actually, the date is postponed until Jan January 2024, okay? Um, so this means you have a lot more time to prep, to sign up, to apply for the program, to take the foundations course if you'd like before then. And you can learn more about the practitioner training program and set up a call with me to go over details on my site, Heather. You don't say my name like that. It's just spelled like that, heatharshepherd.com. Uh, Go to the homeopathy tab and you'll see the practitioner training um, tab there for you to learn more about the program. And um, there will likely be an in-person foundations course happening this fall as well at the farm here, which anybody can take, whether you're in the homeopathic program or not. Let's dive into eye health. Okay, first you know, of course, you know me, this isn't going to come across, this is this message, this uh, around eye health isn't going to be this conventional model where I'm going to tell you to eat more carrots and wear sunglasses and put antibiotic uh, eye drops into your eye or go get steroid shots into your eye. I am not kidding. The last time I was in the um in a, a ophthalmologist office was for my wife which i'll tell you a little bit about her story because she's had a, a bit of a journey with her her eyes and her retina the last time i was in there this lady uh was in was in the waiting room sitting in the chair and she was talking she was having a conversation with the woman next to her saying how she was you know you're what are you here for what are you here for you know that sort of thing she was there because she had macular degeneration that was advanced. And the, the doctor's solution to that issue was for her to come every month or two to get steroid shots in her eye. I cannot think of anything worse than getting a shot in my eye. Anyway, that's not going to be helpful or that's not going to be my approach. I think you know that about me. You're like, obviously, Heather, we know you're not going to talk about that. So the health of your eyes plays a major role in the overall health of your body. So eye health isn't just necessary and okay and a good idea for your eyes. It is, of course, obviously, but it's also 
a very beneficial um, practice or thing for your the health of your entire body. I want to talk about that. But your hormones, your metabolism, your energy levels, your sleep patterns, your fertility is largely dictated or at least highly influenced by the health and state of your eyes. And I know a lot of this episode might be old hat to some of you, but we need to go over some of the basics here and we need to understand this connection between eyes and overall health in order to understand one, one of the main reasons, and it's a big reason, why many people are so sick today and why also people have really bad eyesight today as well. So for those of you who might be hearing this connection between the eye, the eyes and the overall health of the body for the first time, you might be thinking, okay, yeah, sure, Heather, I'd like to know how that works. So don't worry, I'm going to tell you. Now, ophthalmologists, of course, are trained in a very conventional way, like any Western med medical uh, doctor today. Sure, there may be uh, a few here and there um, that have some sort of outside of the box way of practicing and, and thinking. But for the most part, ophthalmologists are trained in a very conventional way. You walk into their office, you get your eye exam. They're going to tell you you need glasses. They're going to tell you you need contacts. They're going to tell you you need this and that. They're going to tell you you need LASIK. They're going to tell you all of these things. LASIK, please don't do it if you've done it. Okay, let it wear off because it will over time. Um, LASIK is a really bad idea. Um, all and you'll learn why by you know through this episode today. It totally messes up um, uh, the eye, the retina, um, contact lenses. All these. They're going to tell you all the things to do that are a bad idea, and you're going to say, "Well, my ophthalmologist told me." And they they told me to prevent macular degeneration and so forth. And they even have blue blockers now at many ophthalmology offices. And their blue blockers oftentimes, almost always, just look like a regular glass lens. Like it looks like a window, the color of a window, right? Those are not blue blockers. They're not going to block nearly enough blue light that needs to be blocked from artificial sources. So you can say, yeah, sure, thank you. You can just go to the ophthalmologist, your ophthalmologist, if you want to check up or if you want to see how your eyes are doing, if that's your thing and you're concerned about it, please, you know, do that. Just take their recommendations with a grain of salt. Unless you're, you know, legally blind or nearly blind, then, you know, um, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more about contact lens and, and glasses as we get into the episode. But just know you're going to, to, to your, see your ophthalmologist, um, go for your, if you want to see what your eye prescription is, if you have some sort of issue come up, you're seeing more floaters. And if you see more and more floaters, this could be a sign that your retina is de detaching. So that actually could be a very helpful thing to go in and see your ophthalmologist about. Or let's say you, you're, you see a, a black line, like half of your vision is lost. That is a sign that your retina has actually fully detached. You need to get medical attention ASAP for that, or else you could go blind in just a few days. Okay, so that's rare. It's more, you know, that's more of a rare thing to happen. But these are some things just to be aware of, or if you're a health practitioner and somebody says, hey, I see floaters and you're like, oh yeah, okay. And you write it down, but it's like, no, I see a lot of floaters. You want to really pay attention to that, to, to that symptom when somebody gives it to you, because you could save them from going through a retinal detachment surgery if you catch it early enough. And one of the early signs for um is that people see a lot of floaters and more floaters and 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 that sort of thing before as of as before the the retina de detaches so i'll do a whole episode on retinal detachment and I'll, I'll talk about it more at the end of the episode but retinal detachment you do actually want to prevent that from happening from from needing that surgery if you can it's not always possible in my wife's case it definitely wasn't possible Maybe it was if we had some of the knowledge about it earlier, but you know, we didn't. And in some cases, it's not possible to prevent a full detached detachment of the retina. So as you see floaters, and this is significant, and don't freak out, okay? I know a lot of people who listen to this podcast have anxiety about their health. I'm right there with you. I totally get that. 
But, you know, a few floaters, okay, if you're seeing them daily and they're getting worse, go to your ophthalmologist, just get it checked out. They say you're fine. Or they say, hey, you have a partial tear in your retina. That's a good time to get laser. That's a good time because it's going to prevent your retina from fully detaching and then having to go through that very invasive surgery. So if you can catch it ahead of time, you know, that's just a little... That's a plug there for anyone who has maybe a lot of floaters or a history of retinal detachment and so forth. Okay, all of that to say, ophthalmologists are trained in a very conventional way, but old school ophthalmology actually had some awareness between this connection, uh, particularly, uh, well, this connection between the eye and overall health. That's out the door at this point in time, but it's still in the old literature. I have some of those books. I'm like, oh, here it is. Here it is. Here's where they talk about it. Okay. And so some awareness also around this connection between, particularly between the eye and hormone health and the eye and metabolic health. If your hormone health is on point, if your metabolic health is on point, you're going to be a pretty healthy person. This is why I'm not a fan of taking hormones to for for any reason right whether you're in menopause and your doctor suggests hormones or you want to change your gender and you need to take or well, you know want to take hormones for that process i am not a fan of any of that because of how huge of an impact your hormones have on every single aspect of your body, your health, your well-being. Okay. So, um, but okay, old school ophthalmology had this awareness between the connection between the eye and the hormones and the eye and uh, uh, metabolic health. Okay. You can find in some of the quote unquote dated literature, literally anatomical references that make this connection. And you can see it. If you Google image it, you can see this connection. So it's not some made up thing. It's, it's right there. It's literally there. Why ophthalmologists aren't talking about this today is absolutely beyond. I have no idea. Well, I do have a lot of ideas. They're not going to make any money telling people not to wear glasses, not to wear contacts, uh, contact lens. They can create a blue blocker line though, but now everyone's doing that. So, I mean, but they could, they literally could, they could think of something else. They can be a little bit more um, creative in their marketing approach. Their marketing approach is a crutch to the eye and makes the eye uh, um, weaker. It compromises eye health, actually. Okay, so um, this this one thing, one reference, one one way we see this reference in that uh, literature is the mention of this pathway called the retinohypothalamic tract. The retinohypothalamic tract. If we were literally to break that word down, it would translate to the retina and the hypothalamus, and then this bridge that connects them. And there, um, there, there's this track that connects them. It connects the, the eye, the retina with this endocrine, major endocrine organ, the hypothalamus. Okay, so right there, just by using common sense tells us that what happens to the retina influences the hormones, right there. That word, the retinal hypothalamic tract is not in modern day literature. Not that I've read or when I've talked to other ophthalmologists about it. No, they're like, what? Oh yeah, that thing. We learned in anatomy one, you know, whatever. So um, for some reasons, modern day ophthalmologists have, have uh, lost sight of this connection. I have no idea how ophthalmologists practice today and, and don't take this connection into consideration. It is a major influential factor, not only on eye health, but on the health of the entire body and the hormones and the metabolism and your circadian rhythm. 
it could be such a game changer if they understood and taught this connection to their patients. I'm not trying to sound elitist here. I'm just reading, I'm reading their, their stuff. I'm, I'm literally just looking at their, what they look at. Right. And other people have too. I'm not making this, this isn't just me. There's a lot of people in the circadian world who know this connection and talk about this connection. And many of them are doctors. So, um, we would have a lot less macular degeneration. We would have people with a lot better vision. We would have a lot less cataracts, a lot less eye issues in general. Um, if they knew about this connection, took the connection seriously, and then applied it to their practice. So this tract connects the retina and the hypothalamus. And along this tract is the SCN the supracosmetic nucle nucleus, and it's this is the SCN is located near the front of the hypothalamus. I know it's a little sciencey, but th this is this is relatively important. It's foundational to our health, honestly, not just eye health, overall health. So this track that connects the retina and the hypothalamus, and then along this track, right right at the the front of the hypothalamus, is the SCN. Okay, and the the main function of the SCN is to register the type of light that comes through the retina. So, hey, the retina sees sunrise. Oh, it's it's daytime, it's early morning. And, and so the SCN receives this message. And so, for example, when the SCN receives that message via the, the light, the light that hits the retina, that message travels to the SCN, right? And then um, it's, it says to the hypothalamus, hey, it, there's red light, there's blue light at, at sunrise. It's this color temperature, it's this brightness. Okay, so start start releasing cortisol, start this process, okay? Your retina facilitated that message and that is the foundation of your hormones and your metabolism. We're supposed to be hungry at breakfast. If you skip breakfast, Watch the sunrise and stop skipping breakfast. Um, you don't have to eat immediately when you wake up, but within the, within an hour, really good idea, really beneficial idea to do that. Um, so the SCN is your main circadian hub. It, and it does so, it regulates your circadian rhythms, your circa circadian biology by registering, by taking that information that the retina sends to it and that message is sent via light. It's a photo message. Your, your retina takes that in. This isn't stuff I'm making up. You're like, that sounds woo-woo. Well, just Google the retina and it'll tell you it's a photo regulator. Um, so if Google says it, I mean, <laughs> you know, they're not woo-woo. <laughs> Google isn't woo-woo. There's a t-shirt. So depending on the time of day and depending on the season, depending on the brightness of the light, um, the SCN will receive this photo signal via the retina. And then it's gonna signal to one of the main endocrine organs, the hypothalamus, hey, this is the light temperature, the color, the brightness, the time of, you know, that, that the retina just sent to us. And it will literally then release certain hormones and certain metabolic signals depending on the color temperature and the brightness of the light that the retina um, uh, took in and sent back uh, to the SCN, to the hypothalamus. So for example, this includes metabolic signals around hunger and satiation. So if somebody has a hard time with nighttime eating and they have to eat at night, my first question is, are you watching the sunrise? If you're not watching the sunrise, now there could be, a, of course, like that's not the only reason, all right? Uh, it's It really bothers me when people are like, this is why, it's the only reason why, this is the only thing. It's never one thing, it's never, it's never one thing. But anyway, okay, so, so this is why, if this is one reason why, if you have trouble with late night eating, um, if you're not watching the sunrise, 
then you mess up the whole circadian signaling for your for your entire day. Your hunger satiation uh, signaling is is off track. Your hormones are off track, and so the single um, uh, the where I would start and the easiest and the most cost effective way to start around if you're having issues with nighttime eating is to walk get up and watch the sunrise in the morning on a consistent and regular basis and see what that does for you. See if that does anything. Um, if it doesn't, you have to look at some deeper issues, but it could be a uh, huge game changer for you. Okay, so um, so this light that the retina receives and sends back to the SCN that then translates this message to the hypothalamus, right? Helps to regulate um, hunger, satiation, sleep-wake cycles, uh, when to release melatonin, when to release cortisol, um, what aromatic amino acids to produce, uh, what gut microbiome bacteria to signal and trigger to produce to send that message then along the gut brain axis. Okay, so um, it's a big deal. The health, the light, the light your eyes receive is a big deal in orchestrating literally every single function that takes place in your body. Uh, the 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 SCN is one of the main circadian regulating hubs in your bodies. It says sets your body's circadian rhythm, right? We I talked about that. And this is literally if you're gonna set a foundation for your health before trying a parasite cleanse, a mold detox, before doing a, a whole supplement regimen before going to a naturopath and spending half of your life savings, literally just um, practice the Sunlight RX because this is going to get your SCN, your circadian rhythm on point. Okay, so um, this is a foundation, where to start. Now, it may not be a panacea for everyone, especially modern people. And I talk about why on the, on the podcast, right? Because we use a lot of suppressive therapies and have a lot of trauma and we need a lot of other, uh, resources to then, you know, add on to the foundation of the sunlight RX, right? But that's a foundation start there. You need to have that in place then before, um, you know, trying all these other things, that foundation is very important to have in place the sunlight RX. So, um, now of course, modern people have thrown this communication system between the retina, the SCN, the hypothalamus totally off track. We've derailed, <laughs> we've derailed and we're on fire. We're burning. We need help, SOS, right? So we've thrown it off with some pretty, um, just our modern day lifestyle practices. Indoor lighting for one, we have LED lights, we have screen time, we have screen time after sunset, we have night shift working, and then we also have sunglasses. All of those practices will um, completely dismantle uh, the signal between your retina and your hypothalamus, um, your circadian biology, your rhythm will be off. Therefore, your hormones will be off. Your metabolism will be off. Your sex drive will probably be off in one direction or the other. Your sleep cycle will be off. Your energy levels will be off. So this is a big deal. You know, I know a lot of you listen to this. You're like, yeah, I know it's this old hat, but you know, maybe there's a new listener out there who really needs to hear, but we also need to understand that our eyes play a major central role in the health of our eyes and in the health of our overall health as well. So when we're looking at and inundating ourselves on a chronic basis with artificial light sources from a screen, from a device, from those effing LED lights in the wall that now you can no longer screw in that have those freaking teeth that you plug in. If you have those, if you're thinking of buying a house, make sure they don't have those in it. And um, if you already have them in it, then um, I would highly recommend getting a different light source, at least having some different options. And if you can't replace all the lights in your house, if that's too expensive, then just get some lamps and use some different lighting. 
So not LED, not, um, <clears throat> excuse me, not LED fluorescence, forget it, okay? Um, so our lifestyle practices uh, and bad, I should say, uh, male illumination, uh, male illumination practices have thrown our health and the health of our eyes completely off track. So, um, and then this sends mixed messages, confusing chaotic messages, your retina to your SCN to your hypothalamus. And so then you have a chaotic, and your whole organism is in chaos just from that, literally. We have too much other shit to worry about throwing our health off. We don't want to have to. Light can be the easiest thing we can control right now, at least. It's the easiest thing we can be in charge of. So, um, and it's the most cost effective as well with a huge return, a huge return. Um, okay. So, you know, if this information is eye opening to you at this point, you can take a deep dive into, I actually just recently created a workshop, the sunlight RX workshop. It's about 60 minutes. It's a pre-recorded PowerPoint where I take you through how to use sunlight, how to uh, incorporate the sunlight RX into your life. Um, in order to support your health and support your eye health and your overall health and so forth. And yes, I talk about all the myths around sunlight and cancer and, and how to prevent that and so forth. So you can go to my site, heathershepherd.com, go to the sunlight tab, and you'll see the, the Sunlight RX workshop. Highly, highly recommend it if this is new eye-opening information to you. Um, it, it, that if this is new information to you, or you want to learn more about it, that workshop for like 40 something dollars will change your life. Um, and if it doesn't tell me and I'll send the money back to you. Um, so basic 101, when it comes to your health, including your eye health, which I'm going to transition to talking more specifically about eye health here in just a minute but is one, don't wear sunglasses. That message, you can wear sunglasses after, you know, at nighttime if you want, um, but don't wear them during the day. Basically do the opposite of everything they tell you to do. One thing is sunglasses. So sunglasses that are on your eyes, they are, it's a dark tint. Then the message, the light message your retina gets, gets is, hey, it's, it's nighttime. We're moving towards nighttime. So then what happens is it sends that light message, that dark message to the SCN, which takes us to the hypothalamus. Hey, it, it seems to be nighttime out. So let's trickle down. Let's start pausing the release of cortisol, which when you see sunlight, that your, your retina is going to send the cortisol message to your hypothalamus. Hey, it's, it's daytime. More cortisol needs to, to be pumped out. And there's many reasons for that. Prevent sunburns, give you, gives you energy, um, uh, helps you, helps you detox, free radical um, remover, the bad guys. We don't want cortisol to be released after sunset, but most people today wear sunglasses during the day, which then triggers them to release less cortisol. Um, and it triggers them to release more melatonin during the day, which we never, we don't want to do that. That's a, that'll destroy your hormones and your metabolic health. That's a sure way to do that. Um, so sunglasses send that message, that dark message to your endocrine glands. And then your endocrine glands think, oh, wow, nighttime, get the melatonin going. And then you don't have any energy during the day. You feel sleepy, but here comes nighttime. And what happens is you're inside we're doing the Netflix thing. We're looking at a screen. So we're literally giving our brain, our retina, our endocrine organs, the opposite message that it needs to function optimally. So we're looking at a screen after sunset and when it's dark and it's blasting us and the color temperature of that screen is literally the color temperature of um, what it is outside at summer solstice it's time for bed, not for like summer solstice, right? It's not time to be outside and it's time for sleeping, healing, melatonin, regeneration, et cetera, right? But we are giving literally the exact opposite message to our body when we do that, when we do that single practice. Millions of people today do that practice, sunglasses during the day, screen time, especially all day, but also at night. And so that right there 
is the biggest hormone and metabolic disruptor that we um, expose ourselves to on a daily basis. So basic 101 when it comes to your health, don't wear sunglasses. Get rid of your artificial indoor lights. Get rid of them. What do you use? Use incandescents. Use halogens. Use amber bulbs. Use red light at night. Then also practice the Sunlight RX. Either get the ebook or take the workshop if you don't know what that is and how to do it. It's literally the most affordable thing you can do for your health. Stop looking at a screen as much. I know we all kind of have to at this point in time. Hey, I'm going to tell you, when Pluto goes into Aquarius, you can forget looking at a screen for that long. I don't think it's going to go well. For <laughs> the Russians and the aliens are going to take that on the, the electrical grid, <laughs> the, aka our government. So um, oh my gosh, I was trying to be, I was trying to be so good today and be like, how can I get this video to stay on YouTube? That probably just crushed it right there. It's probably over with that one. All right, we'll see how that goes. Uh, okay, so reduce your screen time, uh, particularly after sunset. And of course, wear your red blue blockers if you're looking at a screen after sunset. I know this is basic 101, you probably know it, but if you don't, hey, take this as a, a pot of gold and run with it. Um, I get my blue blockers from, uh, gosh, red, oh my gosh, why am I blanking? Midwest red light therapy, I believe. Just put that in your Google thing. It'll come up and get the red blue blockers. You can use my discount code sunlightrx at checkout. They're the most affordable and most effective blue blockers. Get the red lens for after sunset that I found. So affordable. Most people are like $200 for these blue blockers. I'm like, it's a red lens. It's a piece of plastic. Midwest will hook you up. Okay, download download Iris on your computer. It's literally literally $14. These are minimal investments that will last you until the grid goes down. No, just kidding. It'll last you for a long time, okay? So download Iris on your computer. It's 14 bucks. Of course, keep it in sleep mode as much as possible. That makes your screen entirely red. That's not gonna mess up your, your hormones, your circadian rhythms. It's not, okay? It's gonna do it a lot. Uh, less. Of course, now the whole screen thing is another situation, but it'll at least, you're not going to be messing up that signal from your retina to your hypothalamus when you keep it in sleep mode. If you need to see links in order, uh, you know, in color on your screen, if you need to see something in color on your screen, we all have to sometimes, you're trying to buy a new pair of sneakers online and you go to the car and you're like, wait, I thought I ordered, um, I thought they were red and they were really blue. And uh, when they show up at your door, they're blue and you were hoping they were red, right? Sometimes you need to see that what you're, what you're doing, right? So you can change iris to health mode, but I'm going to give you an even healthier suggestion than health mode when you have to oscillate, you know, between the two. Iris has an option that says custom. So you can go into settings and set this up. Custom allows you to set the color temperature of your screen. You can manually do it. And so then whenever you go in and hit custom, it will show up as this color temperature. I recommend doing this and then oscillating between sleep mode and custom when you need to. I'm not going to lie, over probably 90% of the time my computer's in sleep mode. But when I have to oscillate, I put it in custom. And the key here is that you want your custom color temperature below 3000 Kelvin. I set mine around 2860 Kelvin. This will protect your circadian biology even more. I recommend that. <clears throat> okay, let's tie all of this into eye health. There's a few people in the US who have macular degeneration. It's about 30 million, okay? And one out of every 100 Americans uh, over the age of 50 have a vision threatening version of macular degeneration. Macular degeneration is primarily a retinal issue. Retinal, your retina has weakened, it's compromised. It's not functioning optimally. 
part of the retina actually becomes damaged. Sometimes it can become fatty, causing symptoms like blurry vision. Um, like, you know, you're looking at a straight line and it looks wavy. Uh, you, you have, you, you can't, things are blurry when you look close up. There can be a darker a blind spot in the vision, which, you know, we also have to consider possibly retinal detachment, but that's usually an eye. Like you can only see like half of your eye. You can see like above or below, but you can't see, you know, it'll go in one direction or the other for a retinal detachment. There's a, there's a, a big or an obvious change in the vision. Um, you know, and so you, people's faces can look more, more blurry or off. These are, you know, people are like, oh, who, who doesn't have that? Exactly. Who doesn't have that? At least to some degree, right? So we're told the main cause of this is aging. Now, maybe when you're like 86 or 90, your, your eyes might be a little bit more compromised um, as part of the aging process. A 100-year-old, 90-year-old. I can see some compromised vision. Maybe it's getting a little blurry. Maybe. That maybe was a key word. 50? 60? No. Mm -mm. 30? Forget it. No. Okay? What are the real main causes here of macular degeneration? Artificial light exposure, exposure to artificial light after sunset. This is a retina issue. Light affects your retina. Um, sunlight deficiency, not getting out in sunlight enough, not knowing how to interact and have a healthy relationship with sun, sunlight, going out just at noon or when you go on holiday or vacation and you're like, oh, I'm going to get in the sun now. Okay. Um, sunglasses is basically an eye crutch. Um, contact lens, restrict oxygen flow to your eye. And the, the, your, the, your ophthalmologist is going to gaslight you to the to on this one, you're gonna say, do, do my, but do my contact lens restrict oxygen flow to my eye? No, no, they don't. You're gonna tell me putting a piece of plastic over my eye doesn't restrict the oxygen flow to my eye. Well, we've made better contacts today. I'm sure you have, but it, it's, it, it's at least compromising oxygen flow to my eye in some way, shape, or form. And wearing contact lens, a piece of plastic over my eye for years and years and years, you're going to tell me isn't going to impact the health of my eye and my retina. It is. Don't let them fool you. They'll, they'll gaslight you till the cows come home. And screen time, of course. These are the main causes of macular degeneration. Now, you could have a genetic predisposition in place for eye issues, which usually goes on with some sort of family history of alcoholism. Those things might also be in place. We're used to um, seeing people in their 60s and higher get macular degeneration, 60s even young. Your eyes should not have macular degeneration at the age of 60. Now, however, most people in this age group and older um, have been looking at a TV screen or a computer screen for um, years, okay? Um, and now, however, we're also seeing macular degeneration rates growing in younger people, I've, late 20s. I was like, what you have, what condition? Macular degeneration. I've seen it in people in their 20s and 30s. I haven't seen it in a teenager yet, but at this rate, I, I wouldn't fall off my chair. So the screen pandemic that we're currently in, it's increasing the rate of macular degeneration. At, it's increasing it at younger and younger ages. If somebody's 90 and told me they just started seeing, you know, a little blurry, I'd be like, yeah, that tracks. 30, no, not, not these huge macular degeneration signs that we're seeing. So, you know, over, over the past 15 years, I've also worked with a lot of retinal detachment cases. Retinal detachment is something I don't wish on, on my worst enemy. I literally don't. Well, I'm thinking like Bill Gates. We're not going to go there. So um, 
Retinal detachment is when the retina detaches from the back of the eye. And this can happen as a result of injury, like a blow to the eye. Like, you know, I've, I've seen and worked with a lot of boxers who've had this. Somebody gets in a car accident, boom, gets hit in the back of the head and their head jolts. Somebody has an injury to the face or the head, these sort of things. And then the retina can detach immediately. Or, um, for example, in the case of my wife, it happened later on in life is like this gradual, gradual progression towards detachment after the injury. Um, or it just can happen spontaneously in, in people today, uh, not as a result of an accident. That's where I get concerned. Now, my wife had a retinal detachment when we first started dating. She was in her mid twenties. When she was a kid, she was in a crosswalk and got hit by a car. I don't know what she still tells me the story. I'm like, how are you, did you even live past that? She was in a crosswalk, the person didn't stop, and she got hit by the car, hit, knocked her head on the back of the pavement, and um, I have seen this type of retinal detachment happen later on years, years later, this gradual progression towards detachment. So um, it can happen that way as well. She had a detachment in her mid-20s, and when we asked the retinal specialist why this happened, he, he literally looked at Jen, my wife, with a straight face, and he said, age, it's, it's your age. And of course, we know our head from our ass. So when it, when it comes to health, you know, at least we, we know this. And um, we knew that this was a total crock. So since then, I'm like, oh, I'm going to figure out why this happened, what we can do about it, how you can recover, because... Literally, if you have a retinal detachment, even if you have macular degeneration, they're gonna you're gonna say, "What can I do about it? Is there anything I can eat? Is there anything I can do?" They'll be like, "No, no, it's just just the direction of life." That's when you walk out and you never go back, unless you absolutely have to get something checked out. So, I was hardcore into this because I was like, I saw what Jen went through, and I'm like, "Oh my gosh, this is." this is intense. This is really, this is really intense, you know, and they, what they tell you after you have a retinal detachment, and even after you have macular de degeneration, is that not that it's going to get better progressively, or it has a chance to, but it's going to progressively get worse. They told Jen that she would start to develop cataract within six months of having the retinal detachment surgery. It's been 15 plus years and she doesn't have one cataract and she's been lowering her eye prescription because of, you know, what we've learned along this, this journey with her. And then I've helped people do that because literally your doctor will say, oh no, the other one will detach. That one will detach actually multiple times. And, um, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, take these antibiotic drops in your eye for the rest of your life and, see in six months, because I'll probably have to do cataract surgery um, on you. I'm not kidding, that's what they say. Since then, I've helped many people recover from retinal de detachment surgery and partial tears using sunlight, homeopathy, diet. Um, this is gonna sound fancy, but it's not functional neuro training. It's not fancy. It's basically retraining your nervous system. Um, through certain movements, um, herbal eye care, and eye exercises. It's, it's, it might sound basic, but literally, that the eye needs those things. In order to recover, to strengthen, we need to reteach the retina how to, um, how to work properly. I've created an entire holistic program for people who go through retinal detachment. And um, I'm actually in the process of creating a site and resource that's just entirely related to that issue and dedicated to it because there are literally zero helpful resources out there or information for this population, people with retinal detachment particularly. There's not a lot out there for natural macular degeneration. They're going to tell you to take vitamin A and this supplement and that supplement. And it's like, that is not helpful, nor getting to the root of the issue. So we have all these people on supplements for their eye health and they're looking at a screen and they're, you have to change your life if you want to support your eye health. And that means less screen time. It just does. And it means protecting your eyes when you're on the screen. When I'm looking at my screen here, doing this podcast for you all, literally the whole thing's red. 
it's red. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to compromise my health by, you know, for Apple, I'm not going to do it. So um, I encourage you all to as well, not just for Apple, but for also for your own health and your family's health and your eye health. Now, um, I want to end today with a few interesting and hopefully helpful tips and insights about light and your health and the health of your eyes. Okay. Number one, colored lens, uh, eye lens are, are trendy. I think it was last October. I went to a friend's birthday party and, um, uh, we're really good friends with with this guy, and so we went to his birthday party. And the party started at like I don't know six or seven, so um, it was getting dark. And I was like, you know what? I'm wearing my red lens glasses. And so, <laughs> you know, I go in. I'm not in my farm clothes for once. I'm, uh, you know, have actually taken a shower and, <laughs> and you know, so forth but I go in, I have my red lens. I walk in the door. There must've been 30 people in that room um, at the time. I walk in the door and everyone looks at me like, they're just like staring. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm scaring people. They think I'm crazy. And literally somebody shouts out, who's the famous person? Like, because I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. They think this is a trend. I'm literally blocking my eyes from the LED lights that are blasting in this house. And so I know that colored lens are becoming a trendy thing today, okay? Don't wear colored lenses other than amber or red. Amber, if you have to look at a screen during the day or, you know, LED light situation during the day, red after sunset, okay? Yellow, I know some eye uh, blue blocking companies have yellow lenses. They're all right, but I like the amber and the red better just because they block more of the blue light. <clears throat> yellow is better than no protection and yellow is a hell of a lot better than the, the, just the clear lenses that are sold today also. Now, um, we actually need to be wearing protection over our eyes when we're inside, not when we're outside. So um, take this into consideration, especially under fake lights or in front of a screen. You're just hanging out in your house. You don't have to go that far. You don't have to do it, okay? We don't have to get dogmatic here. Just screen time, LED time. Yeah, okay. It's a good idea to protect your eyes because of everything I shared with you today. So... Um, the other thing I, I want to mention here about colored lenses is please don't wear pink lens. Pink lens have shown to coincide with an increase in cancer, with mental emotional disturbances and aggressive behavior. And I wouldn't wear these and I wouldn't suggest wearing them and I wouldn't let your kid wear anything pink over their eyes. I know it could be like fun, but but I don't know where your pink lenses went. They had to go by, right? I just don't don't do that. Okay, train yourself out of your glasses or at least train yourself into a lower eye prescription. And I know this isn't always possible, isn't always possible. My wife literally needs to wear glasses because she can't see very far in front of you. Her, her, she has a strong, her myopia is strong. I know some people's are very strong. Okay, but at least... You can work on gradually lowering your eye prescription. We want to try to go down and not up. Many people, after they practice the Sunlight RX, they eat, they change their diet. They're eating more fat. They're eating less sugar. They're eating more meat. They're, they're protecting themselves against artificial light. They go into their doctor with, just by doing that, their ophthalmologist, and their prescription eye prescription has lowered. They're like, oh, I don't know what I did. Those things have the potential to lower your eye prescription. I have seen many people have that experience after incorporating these things into their lifestyle. Um, now for me, uh, my eye prescription is very low. After my wife had a retinal detachment, I said, fuck this, I'm not wearing contacts ever again or glasses and I literally threw them away. I haven't worn them since, my eyes have gotten better. Yeah, things are a little blurry if I look far away. Can I still see? Can I still manage? Am I training my eyes to get better? Absolutely. So um, 
<clears throat> train yourself out of your glasses, not into a higher prescription and, uh, and start training yourself, um, at least wear them less, even if you're legally blind. You'll just try wearing them less. Do the Sunlight RX. You'll be shocked, I think, at even a little bit of a noticeable difference. Um, so uh, get rid of your contacts. If you use contacts, I would recommend swapping to glasses if you need to wear something, okay? So get rid of contacts, swap for glasses. Hey, you know I don't like a trend, but glasses, they have some cool looking glasses right now. Get some cool looking glasses. Highly recommend that over contacts. Um, what else? Okay, screen time. We know it's a silent killer for the eyes. And in my opinion, it causes um, the condition that we have labeled skin cancer, which technically isn't really a cancer at all. But screen time does something very interesting to the eye. For one, uh, one thing I'll mention here is that we're always looking up close at this, this thing. And the, the screen, the way it's designed, we blink less. So we get dry eye more. And so there's when their eyes are dry, there's less oxygen that goes to the eye. When there's less oxygen that goes to the eye, there's less, uh, there's more free radicals that can get into the eye. The eye is more susceptible to injury and damage and, and it becomes more compromised. And there's less water flow in the eye, which means there's less electrons in the eye. All of that from just looking at a screen and not blinking as much. It, looking at a screen, you will blink less. Even if you try, you'll lose track of things in 10 minutes and you'll be like, oh shit, I forgot to blink. Um, so that's number one, but number two, you're looking very close up. And so most people today, their eyes are trained only to look at objects that are right in front of them. This is why people can't see you far away that well. And um, when it comes to your eyes, the internet will tell you, hey, for every 20 minutes you look at a screen, for 20 seconds look in the distance to balance it out. That's not really balancing it out with 20, literally 20 seconds, 20 minutes to 20 seconds. That's a ridiculous recommendation. It should be more like when you're on your computer for 20 minutes or however many minutes it is, match that with that much outdoor time and spend time looking in the distance when you are outside. Don't go outside and like, I'm gonna go outside now and read a book. That could be amazing and you're outside and you should do that. But if you're just trying to balance this with up close screen time, we need to balance our, the, you know, looking at things up close versus looking at things far away. Most people don't look at things far away. And if you live in a city, some things you can't even see far away. So get to a place where you actually have this option so you can train your eyes to look in the distance more. It's really healthy. It's a good practice for your eyes. Um, I think that is all I will say about light health and eye health for, for today. We'll see you next week.